Hello and welcome to Rob from the Internet Talks About Beer, a show where we discuss different styles of beer, beer history, beer flavor profiles, we give shout outs to breweries we think make exceptional beer, and we talk about whatever else comes to mind during the course of the conversation. I'm Rob from the Internet. Let's talk about beer. All right, so joining me today is uh, my buddy Gary Gilman. Gary, if you would, tell me a little bit about yourself, how you got into craft beer, and what you do when you're not talking about or drinking craft beer. <laughs> thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you, first of all, for being on your show. Uh, your show has definitely cut a swath, and I, I appreciate very much being here. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I'm Gary Gilman, like you said. Um, I live in Toronto, and... Um, just very quickly, I'm really right now, I'm a full-time beer blogger, uh, writer of journal articles, um, and, and just engaged in many aspects of the beer world. I was a lawyer in my professional life for decades, but I'm retired from that, so I don't practice law anymore. Uh, when I did, I did act for some breweries and distilleries, though, so even in my professional life, it fed into the beer world. Um, so... Maybe as we discussed earlier, I could just explain a little bit about how, even especially in those years when I had a day job, you know, how did I get involved in, in the beer world? I'm, I, I'm from Montreal. I was brought up in Montreal, and I only moved to Toronto in the 1980s. And um, in the 70s in Montreal, so aging myself a bit here, um, <laughs> I started to drink beer, as many people did, right, with your pals and... Uh, uh, my first taste was actually at my grandmother's. I was offered a taste, as a lot of young people are, when I was 15. And uh, in Montreal, it was probably Molson Export or Labatt 50 or one of those brands. And um, I found the taste unusual, which a lot of people do when, when they have their first taste of beer. And two or three times after that, I tried it uh, with friends. Uh, maybe I hadn't quite reached the right age, in fact, uh, but I tried it anyway. <laughs> And then, um, <laughs> and then finally it, it kicked in, like all of a sudden I, I liked it a lot, you know, maybe three, four times after first trying it. And, um, and then I bought just beer casually on the weekend maybe, or after exams in school, uh, college exams. I was at McGill for many years in Montreal. And, uh, and I settled on two or three beers I liked, Molson Export, Labatt 50, um, Molson Golden came along in the 70s, too, and, and that type of Canadian ale. And I probably tried the odd lager, too, like Molson Canadian, but I, I tended to prefer the ale. I didn't really think about beer more than that, but I'll, I'll describe to you the, the, the key event that, it, you know, looking back, I feel made the difference and made me focus on beer. And it was trips to Plattsburgh, New York, which is a border town in northern New York State, and not that far from Montreal, we used to go just for evenings sometimes, visit the clubs. It was a former, it was an active Air Force base then because of the war in Vietnam. Very busy. The big birds, they called them, you know, were, were very busy there. And the clubs were packed uh, with all kinds of people. And, um, and we used to go. They had great live bands. I've written about some of this on my blog. And, uh, and I noticed that the beers were different. I, the glowing neon signs, you know, in my memory, I can still see them. Uh, Peels, Schaefer, Valentine, Jenna, Genesee, and Jenny. Like, and I said to myself, like, why are they different? Well, why isn't it the same as at home? You know, most people would not have noticed that. But for some reason, I fixed on that. And, uh, and I really enjoyed the, the taste. They weren't the same as our beer, and they weren't quite alike one to the other. They were similar, but different one to the other. And, um, and at some point I bought my first beer book called All About Beer by John Porter. There is a good name for a beer man, a beer, a beer writer. <laughs> and, uh, and I started to learn about beer that way. And of course, Michael Jackson, the great beer writer, came along in the late 70s. And uh, I, I kept learning more and more. And then when I was traveling with, with uh, my wife, Libby, I was married by then, I would try different beers and, and learn more that way. And finally, um, meet the like-minded. And, and I, I got to know Michael Jackson. We were friends and helped him to travel in Ontario when he started to visit here, set up uh, visits to breweries and uh, 
Upper Canada Brewery, uh, Creamore Brewery, you know, Wellington uh, Brewery in, in, in Guelph. So, that, you know, my, my interest and my reading just broadened. And with the commencement of craft beer, I attended festivals. I met more like-minded people there. I met beer writers, other beer writers than Michael. I met home brewers, which I know this you have focused on in your beer interest, um, and who are at, which are a big part of the, of the craft beer history. I mean, the, the home brewing situation is vital, and I tasted many fantastic home brews. I never home brewed myself. I never had the right setup for it. Um, so. And then what was the, the next key event, I think, was traveling with Jackson, Michael Jackson, in Europe. We did a beer tour of beer de garde breweries in northern France in the early 90s. And um, he, of course, would, would not, did not drive. And uh, we drove, we had a car, and we drove him on a tour that I helped organize with a French a beer consumer group there called Les Amis de la Bière, which still exists. And uh, that was really interesting. You know, he was received like a rock star at, at <laughs> and this, this is in France, you know, in the, in the early nineties, but his books had been out for a while, but I was amazed to see in, in a non-English environment, how well known he was, how respected. And we were feted and given tours of, of all different sizes of breweries, the surviving old French artisan breweries, the craft scene hadn't recommenced yet or was just beginning there, you know, and and large industrial ones, too, like Pelforth and in, uh, in Lille, which I think by then was owned by Heineken um, uh, and so forth. So and then later in the 90s, with the development of the online environment uh, that enabled a deeper degree of, of interest and learning and. Uh, Interacted with a lot of the figures that are still well known in the beer world today. Some of them had blogs. Some of them were already writing professionally. Uh, finally set up my own blog in, in 2015, but was, I think, pretty well known in the beer historical space anyway, which I tended to have focused on in my, my beer interests. Um, and then got more known when I set up my blog, which I've been quite active with at times posting daily for years, um, mostly on beer and mostly on beer history, but sometimes on food, sometimes on, uh, on spirits, uh, whiskey. Uh, I had, a, had an interest in, in whiskey for a long time, which I, I wrote about as well. Um, and now, now that you know, I'm past my, my professional uh, uh, work, uh, I can focus on, on these different areas of, of beer uh, full time. And, uh, and I, you know, saw your, your, your tweeting and, and, and some of the interviews you've done with people. And I thought, yeah, wow, it'd be great if I could speak with you. And now we're doing it. So. Ta-da. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Well, today, folks, we are going to be talking about the aptly named Porter uh, style yes. of beer. So, yes. Uh, as as Gary alluded to, there the, there was a book by a guy whose last name was Porter, and we are drinking uh, Porter and talking about Porters today. Uh, for people who haven't seen the three other episodes we've done with Porters as part of the uh, the lineup, Porter is a style of beer that was developed in London, England, in the early 18th century. Uh, it's a fairly well hopped and dark appearance. Uh, you know, and it, it, the dark appearance comes from uh, using brown malts or, or uh, black malt. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it, it, the name originated because it was really popular with the street and river porters of the time, uh, you know. So, uh, and it's a name that stuck around, you know, well into today. Now you also have things like Baltic Porter, which in my eyes is actually just an imperial stout made somewhere else. And you have imperial porters and you've got robust porters and you've got... I don't know, all sorts of other porters out there. You've got your English brown porter and things like that. Um, today, I am going to be drinking Clifford uh, Brewing in uh, Hamilton, Ontario. Their, their, their signature porter. It is, a, I, I believe technically it's a robust porter. So um, it'll, be, it'll be a little bit, a um, little hoppier, a little more bitter than, than an English brown porter. Uh, and it won't have like the, the roasted 
barley flavors, but it will have some nice chocolate and coffee notes to it. Right. Great choice uh, of beer. And I, I like that one a lot. Um, and I've got, if I may say, I have um, Collective Arts Porter, also from Hamilton. So uh, kind of the brewery next door, so to speak, not 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 technically geographically, but in the, in the same region. And, um, and yeah, and I, you know, I think that this one and the one you've chosen, Rob, are, are great, um, great beers to compare and contrast because they're, they're both really, I think in, in my view, very English style, very traditional porters. They're not flavored, right? They're not, um, they, they don't have a strong emphasis on, um, on American hops, I, I would say, um, the Cascade Hop is used actually in Collective Arts, with, along with Nugget, but it doesn't have a, a strong profile. It, you know, maybe um, it's used a lot in the boil, I think, so it, the bitterness is mostly neutral. And um, yeah, to me, these two beers represent really pretty much everything one would want in good porter. Yeah, um, so so Clifford Clifford's porter is used as a base for several other of their styles. I mean, they've got... Uh, yeah. I've got several of their uh, barrel-aged Imperial Porters in my beer cooler right now, and I also happen to have a can of their standard Imperial Porter, um, yes. which, which is another great beer. Um, now, you, you've got Collective Arts, so that's uh, Stranger Than Fiction, I believe, is, is what that one's that's called. That's right. Yeah, you're right. That's and there is and there is a flavor variant on that. There is a coconut one um, that they make, which is absolutely fantastic as well. Um, for Collective Arts, I actually have sitting down here with me a can of their bourbon barrel aged Imperial Porter, which if you okay. haven't if you haven't had it, is also fantastic. And I've got an example from Muddy York, Muddy York Porter. Okay. Uh, Muddy York Porter is oh, it's it's another it's another great one. It ranks right up there in in. Uh, uh, for, for, for craft beers that I've had in Ontario, it ranks right up there in the top five of the porters I've ever had here. So it's, uh, it's nice. I'll look for it. You know, Porter is, as you said, I mean, one of the great beer styles. And, um, when I first went to Britain, uh, in the eighties, uh, there wasn't a lot of Porter and Stout. Of course, Guinness was there. It, it, it was still made there actually in Port Park, Royal London at that time. Um, but the Mackeson stout was available, but there wasn't too much else. Most of it, except for courage, Imperial Russian stout, of course, which held the wave, the flag for strong stout. Most of it had died out you know, earlier in the 20th century. And, and then it came back and, and grew and grew with craft as it has here. But yeah, it's really one of the great drinks, and there's so many interesting aspects to its history. Endless, look, really, a very complex history. Many different economic, social, um, you know, so many different. Um, you, you could write uh, ten books on on porter. Right? You could write an encyclopedia on porter. It's just a fascinating uh, beer style, and. Um, yeah, so it, it's usually a, an evergreen with me. I always have it in the in the fridge, you know. And mm -hmm. um, I just want to say something briefly about the bourbon barrel uh, porter, Rob, because you know here's where I think a study of history kind of sh throws an interesting uh, light on it. And um, the bourbon, the uh, beer historians know that uh, a certain type of oak wood was was prized by British brewers for pale ale, and in, and in most cases, porter and stout as well. And that was a wood from Eastern Europe, from a certain part of the Baltic region, Poland, Russia. Uh, it was fairly neutral on the beer, you know, and, uh, and, and, and wore well. The, the Coopers could fashion it easily, and yet it was fairly hard wearing. And um, they didn't like American wood for that purpose. For whiskey, the distillers in Scotland loved it and in Ireland. But American oak was not liked for to hold uh, stout and porter. And uh, bourbon barrel stout goes against that grain completely. And that's <laughs> completely. what I find fascinating about it. And I've, I've studied how it came about. Uh, Innocent Gun played a big role in 
in adapting the American barrel generally to beer, not necessarily with stout, but with their ales. And, uh, and then in America, as we know from uh, Goose Island and all that history in Chicago, bourbon barrel stout emerged, uh, also using the American oak barrel. Uh, in that case, having held whiskey, but what's more important, I think, is the wood itself. Because as we all know, I think most of us know who like a drink, Chardonnay wine, right, and bourbon whiskey has that vanilla, that that vanilla and mm-hmm. coconut taste, you know, and uh, yeah, and and it's really interesting the taste that gives to to imperial stout. Um, so and to ale, uh, brown ale, and so forth. So yeah, it's an interesting development. Um, I think my taste in in beer was formed years before bourbon barrel stout became a thing. So while I enjoy the odd example. Um, I, I tend not to, to, you know, I tend to prefer imperial stout that was not aged in, in American oak, just a personal taste. Yeah, no, I, I mean, and that's what beer is all about. It's like, it's about what you like. Um, I, I really, really enjoy the barrel aged beers. I don't care if it's a porter. I don't care if it's a stout, a barley wine, you throw, you throw any good beer into a barrel of any sort it can be a rum barrel a whiskey barrel a wine barrel it could be a fresh barrel i don't i don't care and just throw it in the corner for a year and then i'll come back and drink it and i guarantee nine times out of ten i'm gonna enjoy the hell out of that beer because there's just something about the aging process that imparts so much depth of flavor and it and it can take a beer that would normally be kind of harsh and really mellow it out and make it sweet and enjoyable and and just give you like a whole different perspective on that style of beer because it's picked up so many things from sitting in a barrel and just biding its time. Certainly true. And, you know, and no matter what the source of the wood for oak barrels was in the old days, uh, holding beer for six months uh, and lager for that matter, which was also stored in, in uh, barrels, although they were lined on the inside as, as I think, you know, with pitch, Yep. With pitch. That was the European practice. The British didn't do that. So that to some extent shielded the wood from the beer. But um, but certainly in Britain, um, yeah, keeping beer for six months, a year, 18 months as, as early porter was often stored for would have allowed oxygen to get in, would have dampened the hop, some of the hop effects and balanced out the beer, no question. So yeah, um, I can see, and I notice myself, you know, in some of the, what I find about, about the bourbon barrel beers is that they, they, they can vary a lot, even amongst the same brand. That's the fascinating thing. You can never predict exactly how the palate will come out. Right. Yeah. You're, you're correct. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And you might have this big wide range of, okay, we might get flavors that range from this to this, but we never know exactly what combination of these flavors is going to come through. You can kind of guess like, you know, if you use the same exact, uh, brand of, of bourbon barrels every time you can, you can kind of narrow it down. Okay. We know we're going to get some flavors that range from here to here. You're not going to get the entire gamut of flavors, but you can never know for sure which ones are going to take precedence and which ones are going to, you know, be on the forefront, which, but you know, it's one of those things that I find is, uh, makes it more enjoyable for me. It's like, Oh, what have we got in store this time? (laughs) No, exactly. Uh, like sometimes the, the, the vanilla and coconut, uh, profile is is muted for for whatever reason. It's always hard to know why. And other times it's quite strong. Um, other times other flavors come to the fore. I've had some really good ones, no question. Um, but but again, you know, I guess if if I'm if if I have my druthers, you know, um, maybe pro- probably because my early examples of the style were were not bourbon barrel aged mm-hmm. or or American oak aged. You know, they were aged in. Uh, in, in um, European wood or probably just steel, you know, stainless steel processing. And so, you know, my taste tend, some of the early uh, Northern European examples of, of Imperial Stout uh, or Stouts that were in that style, um, Carnegie, uh, you know, the Porter, which was not strong, but was kind of felt to replicate a, an Imperial profile. Uh, you know, was such a, a modern, more of a modern take on it, you know, without a strong barrel note, but, um, but really good, super rich, um, slightly roasted. And, and yeah, the, the bourbon barrel 
tradition has continued that. In fact, I'm, I'm attending the, the Goose Island uh, uh, tasting uh, tomorrow. Uh, so I'll, I'll be tasting this year's iteration of Goose Island, which is, as you know, so well known for its role in stimulating the bourbon barrel stout thing. Yep. Um, I don't get to taste it every year, um, but I decided this year I, I want to revisit it. So I'm going to go with some friends tomorrow, tomorrow night, and that should be quite interesting to see how what they do this year. Yeah, uh, I, want, I, I wanted to ask you. Sorry, Rob. Yeah. As a home brewer, have you ever been able to? Have you ever tried to brew an imperial stout with, possibly with barrel aging or stave aging? Y- y- yes, on both counts. Um, my 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 uh, staple beer when I do brew is an imperial stout that typically comes in around ten and a half percent ABV. Wow. Um, and really? I, yeah, and, and I have barrel aged it, uh, before I moved to Canada, I actually had a, I had a barrel that I bought from Forrester, um, which, which is a whiskey. Um, I bought a barrel from them and I, 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 I had a five gallon system at the time and that barrel was a 55 gallon barrel. So I, I brewed little over 10 batches of beer and put it into that barrel and then wheeled it into the corner of my basement and let it sit for nine wow. months. <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm impressed. How, how, what were the results like? Uh, Mediocre at best. Um, my basement was probably not the best place to keep it because my basement was finished and the, you know, so it didn't, it didn't stay as cool as I would have liked it. If, if I would have, if I would have been uh, of more forethought, I would have uh, moved it out to my garage, which was not uh, insulated so that it could have, uh, could have been more like, uh, like they treat, um, like they treat whiskeys and bourbons. It could have, it could have experienced a little bit more of a, of a temperature fluctuation and gotten a nice cold winter because uh, my my garage, you know, it, it never got below freezing, but it never uh, it it also never got above like eighty five degrees in there either. So it would have been it would have been a nice range of like uh, you know forty five degrees Fahrenheit to uh, like seventy five degrees Fahrenheit. But you know, uh, it was okay. Um, if if I had to do it again, uh, I would I would probably choose a different style of barrel. Um, I would probably go with more like something like a rum barrel, something that's going to be a little more forgiving with the, uh, the flavors, uh, as well, uh, wow. for, for, for home, for home use. I mean, I love bourbon, bourbon barrel aged, uh, stouts and things like that. Um, but I have a feeling that, um, my, my particular stout with its, uh, profile is, is more, uh, more, more in line with something a little sweeter. So like, uh, like a rum or something like that. Interesting. Did, did you get any acidification through the aging process? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I got, I got really heavy notes, um, uh, of vanilla and then really heavy notes of the oak wood itself. Um, so when, when you drank it, I mean, you were drinking it and you could really taste it. I mean, it tasted like you had like a cube of, uh, a cube of wood in your mouth when with it while you were drinking. It. I mean, it really took on the, uh, the flavor profile. Interesting. Interesting, you know, because some of the even in uh, even in Britain where they were using this European oak that was said to be quite neutral in taste, despite despite that, they still subjected them to heavy scouring and using soda uh, solutions, you know, to rub out any oak taste, even in something relatively neutral, you know. So I don't know whether whether the um, the, the brewers internationally today that do bourbon barrel stout, whether they, some of them do that or, or do they just use the barrel as is, you know, as it comes to them? I don't know. Uh, I know the, the brewers that, that I'm friends with that, uh, that have used barrels at their, at their places. Um, they just literally get them off the truck, you know, and they, they, uh, they make sure that they're not funky on the inside. Cause there's usually still a little bit of whiskey left in them. Um, and you know they'll they'll just uh, make sure that they're not uh, there's no big chunks or gunk in them, and if if they're decent, then uh, yeah, they they uh, they try to sanitize it just a little bit, make sure that they're not getting too much funk in there, and they just put their beer in. I mean, so. interesting. Here here's something kind of cool again, the history angle, but there's one source I found a few years ago from the early uh, 1800s refers to British uh, porter barrels being sent to the Caribbean uh, to be obviously consumed and then filled with rum, new overproof rum and sent back to Britain. And uh, 
the source says uh, it, it's good if you leave a little porter in the in, in in the in the cask, you know, before filling it with rum. So it's kind of like returning the favor, right? It's the the obverse of uh, right of the uh, bourbon barrels, <laughs> the the other end of the same uh, stick, you know. Uh, and I I kind of like that, kind of brings uh, brings the circle around, so to speak. Um, but yeah, porter is one of the great. I mean, for me. But again, it, it's partly formed as I was in a certain at a certain time, uh, and subjected to certain influences. I, I would I'd have to rank probably the beer styles that I'm really fond of are relative relatively narrow group, you know, which are porter and its its whole family, mm -hmm. its whole family, including milk stout, all the all the variations you mentioned, um, as well as as um, Black IPA, maybe that's more IPA than porter or stout. I don't know. Depends on the on the bottle sometimes on the recipe. But anyway, the porter family, the pale ale family, including the original British and American extensions of it, and Pilsner, Lager, Dunkel, Bach, <laughs> you know, German, Czech. The, those great. Those three. And I, you know, probably people who read me may think I return to them a lot, and I do. It's not that I don't try the others. Saison, we all know the types and the names. Trappist and, you know, all the many, some of them are really interesting, fine beers. But I, I do come back to those three families personally, you know. And if I did brew at home, which I don't, but maybe one day I will, I would, I would, I would choose among, I think, that group primarily. Yeah. You know. Well, I mean, I'm the same way. Um, you know, uh, my, my big styles are, are the porters and stouts. Um, and then, and then the English ale. So I love, I love, uh, you know, an ESB and an English, uh, in, just a, any standard English bitter and, uh, an English mild, an English brown ale. I mean, all those, I love basically anything that has a, a very malt forward or a very heavy malt backbone are the styles of beers that I gravitate to. Um, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of 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 uh, the modern interpretations of the IPAs. You can, you know, I I, I can uh, take or leave the New England IPA. I can I can uh, I can definitely leave the West Coast IPA. It's too bitter for my liking. Um, but you know, I, I do enjoy a good saison. That's my wife's favorite style, so it's another one that gets brewed frequently here. Um, and then you know, I I, I like sour beers, and I I like Belgian beers, and. And I like Belgian sour beers. <laughs> so interesting about, about the sour aspect. Yeah. Um, if if you asked me, Rob, if you asked me, what's the one thing, the one surprise that you have in how beer has developed and emerged, you know, from where you saw it start, I would say the onset of sour beer. I never would have predicted that. Yeah, no, because sourness. Exactly. Yeah, I would have never predicted it either. Uh, you know, you've always had those few, like the 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 the, the Flanders Red and things like that, the Ode Bruin. But I would have never, in a million years, thought that uh, you're going to have this big uprising of all these different types of sours. It's just. Well, me too. So why why do you think that is? Do you think there's a kind of a a latent human? Um, interest and need for that kind of palette or is it just fashion fashion driven what what explains it do you think i don't know you know i think it's it's probably a little bit of both because i mean there are some people who prefer things that are sour like you know i i, I had uh, i have relatives that uh, they'll make lemonade that's basically just squeezed lemons with just enough water to make it so it's not lemon juice uh and very little sugar i mean so you know there, there are people whose palate tends more towards the sour aspect of things um it's true and you, you know there are some there are some really good sours out there like it, it, if the, if you pair it with the right flavor you know it's not just sour for sour's sake you have a good flavor profile with with that that pucker it is it is nice when it's like a really hot day they tend to be a nice quenching style beer and i think that's part why they've caught on is because people realized if they drink these, you know, it does kind of quench your thirst. So, you, you know, that's a good, a good point about quenching and the right occasion for it. And I can add to that, that what you just said brings to mind uh, one of the last trips we did before the onset of, of COVID-19 was in Belgium. So it's what, more than two years ago now, two, three years ago in uh, Ghent. Uh, and I ordered a, a Rodenbach there. Fantastic Just because, beer. not because I really, 
Hey, I'm sorry. Fantastic beer, Rodenbach. It is, you know, it, it's so interesting in how it tastes, how it's its history. Uh, there's a, kind of a British connection to the history, which the historians know, which is which is also fascinating. And those fitters that they have, and um, wow, it's so. When I ordered it, the um, the server said, you know, not too many people order that, and uh, I, I said, is that because it's a touristic oriented? city uh, she said no it, very few belgian people order it and i said well why is that and she said because it's not because of the taste but because it only goes with certain food it it's primarily ordered by people that order not just order like a main course to eat but it's, but certain foods certain rich dishes mm -hmm. she started to explain what those were and she said, that's the profile of the beer here. So unless you're dining, unless you're eating a certain thing, you, you're not going to just order that for casual drinking. You know, you'll order a pills or, or an ale or something else. And uh, I thought that was very interesting, you know, that because I wouldn't normally think of it that way. To me, it's just another choice on the palette of options in beer, which is almost endless, right? right. And uh, I either like it or I don't, but no, <laughs> it, it has a specific function, you know, and I thought that, that, that shows you the importance of local context and. Oh yeah. Most definitely. Right culture. Most definitely. Yeah. Uh, you know, and yeah, sour, sour beers, like, uh, like, like heavily bittered beers are great. If you're, if you're, uh, if you're having something that is extremely rich or extremely like something that that's super fatty or, or super, uh, super laden with sugary flavors, it's going to, it's going to help cut that. So, so that it doesn't uh, seem as overwhelming. I mean, if you're, if you're, you know, eating something that is, you know, indulgently rich and you have a nice uh, sour beer to go with it or, or a really nice bitter beer to go with it. It's going to cut that so, so that your mouth doesn't just feel, you know, you don't get that super cloying sweetness or you don't get that, that uh, overindulgent uh, fattiness in your mouth that, that can sometimes, you know, cause, cause you to feel ill. You know, there you are. That's exactly really what she was explaining to me. And uh, and the dishes she described were of a very rich, gelatinous nature, uh, meat-driven mostly, as I recall it. So there, I you know, I really learned something there, being uh, on site, so to speak, you know, in its context. And uh, and that's, you know, so much of beer is like that, I guess. Um, it has to fit the the place that it emerged from. But, uh, but in general, though, speaking generally, and also from a knowledge of, of the history of beer technology, you know, much of which was driven to try to avoid any acetic development, mm -hmm. you know, the, the development of pure single, uh, single cell yeasts, you know, in, uh, in, ferment, in the history of the fermentation industries proves that too, that, you know, they were trying to get away from that. And so I think that was the general tendency, but yeah, I guess it, it's hmm, this latent taste and the suitability with certain foods must explain the, the revival, which is, which is good, you know? And I always say like, whether I prefer every example or not is kind of neither here nor there. You know, if it sells beer for the brewers, I'm all for right. it. You know, I want them to stay in business and uh, if they can make money selling this versus that, good for them. Um, whether, Gilman likes it or not, <laughs> or that brand of it is neither here nor there. Yep. Uh, hey, for, for anyone out there who's listening, if you're interested in the details, um, typically Porter should be served in a, a, a Nonic style pint. Um, this happens to be a, 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 an Imperial pint. So it's actually 20 ounces. So you actually get a 16 ounce pint pour into it. Um, temperature should be between 10 and 13 degrees Celsius. That's 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit for my friends South of the Canadian border. Um, and you know, it pairs well with, with, uh, with a lot of cheeses with grilled meats, uh, chocolate ice cream, <laughs> anything with chocolate really, um, because it's got that same kind of flavor profile. It's uh, it's it's nice. Um, you know, it should be it should be moderately bitter. So twenty five to forty IBUs is typical for uh, for the robust style. Uh, a little bit lower for the English brown style. A little bit higher for for some of the imperial styles. Uh, typical alcohol content should be between five and six and a half percent thereabouts. Um, what's this one come in at? This one comes in. 
at 5.9 with uh, 38 IBU. So it's well within the, uh, well within the limits. Um, if, if you like the flavor profile of chocolate uh, with slight hints of coffee, um, the Clifford one, if uh, they use Fuggle hops, I believe is the one that they use for theirs. So you get kind of like a, a slight peppery flavor profile with some earthiness to it. Um, it's nice. Um, it, it helps, it helps balance it out quite well. And it, uh, you know, it's, it is, it's, uh, it's got a nice complex flavor profile. So you're not just going to be tasting just chocolate. You're going to be tasting all sorts of little things in there, nuances in there. It's great. Yeah, no, that's a good capsule, Rob. And I agree with everything you said, including the glass. And, and, you know, usually I'm quite strict on, on glassware today. I'm not, I chose a, a Waterford goblet, <laughs> you know, for this port. I don't know why I never, I never drink beer in this, but it's the first thing I saw when I opened the cupboard, you know, and so here we are. Gary getting but, all um, fancy on us here. <laughs> well, there you go. You know, uh, actually, I, I have a Waterford mug, handled mug that got a nice comment on Twitter from, a, you know, a reader. So uh, I thought I'd revisit with this different design. Oh, here. Yeah. But, uh, you, you know, uh, proper glassware will enhance the experience of whatever style of beer you're no question. But but uh, my belief is if it's a good beer, it's going to taste like a good beer in any glass that you pour it in, including the Red Solo cup, as long as you pour it properly. <laughs> That's true. That's true. The only exception I would make to that, it's not really an exception, is that, um, and I know a lot of people don't agree with me, but I cannot drink beer from the container, the bottle or the can. I cannot. <laughs> I, I, I never do. Why? Because I can't see it. I must, I have to see it to appreciate the experience it's ingrained in me it's funny i don't know if you share uh, that but i most for most beers i i prefer them in in a, a glass of some sort um there are some beers that uh, lend themselves to not caring things like if you're at a barbecue and someone hands you like a molson or a coors light or something like that i don't care if that's in a glass because it's not gonna yes. it, it's not gonna improve the for flavor <laughs> kind of no i'm with you on that or rolling rock you know or something like yeah that. but but a uh, anything else? Yeah, I'm 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 big on having it in a glass. I've got to see it. I've got to look at it, you know, and and look at the foam, look at everything, the color. Well, and you're not you're not doing the, yourself any favors by drinking it out of the can or, or the bottle because you're not releasing the excess CO two. You're not releasing any of the aromas, so you're not getting the full experience of of what the brewer wanted you to feel and and to experience when you're drinking it. So true. And the release of carbonation is very important. I agree with you. Um, I'd rather have less carbonation than than more. And I guess cast conditioned ale, um, in the British way, originally it was British, um, exemplifies that experience, yep. right? With the low bubble carbonation and and the full flavor of the beer coming through, especially top fermentation beer, mm -hmm. uh, which traditionally is the one cast conditioned. Um, yeah, and it just tastes great at that temperature and, and carbonation level. Uh, but you know what? A after a certain point in my beer education, uh, I got to the point where I could drink beer at any temperature, any temperature, you know, off the shelf, warm, ice cold. Uh, if you have the beer palate, uh, I think that you reach that most of us, or well, maybe, maybe not most, but many reach that point, you know, at a, you, know, you can enjoy beer at any temperature. There will be an ideal mm -hmm. temperature, no question. But I can drink it anyway. And I know if it's good or not, good, good meaning if I like it uh, at any temperature. Well, yeah, reason, no, you're, you know? you're not wrong. I mean, I will, I will often, uh, I store, I store most of uh, anything that I'm not cellaring to store for a later consumption date. If I'm just putting it to keep it to where it's convenient for me, I'll put my Imperial styles and everything in the fridge and uh, I will open them and I will pour them into a glass and I will start drinking them cold because you get one flavor profile there. And as it warms up, it starts to open up and you get a different flavor profile as you move through the different temperatures. So it, it can be a really cool experience to start with something below the optimal temperature and just drink it as it comes up to temperature. So you can experience, okay, this is what it tastes like if I just pull it out of the fridge. This is what it tastes like at the optimum temperature. And this is what it tastes like beyond the optimum temperature. So you'll know. So you, you, and then you'll have that experience and you, you can 
eventually get to the point like you are and like I am where you can pretty much drink beer at any temperature as long as it's a good beer. I mean. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it certainly will not taste the same at each of those levels. It's true. And it, part of the part of the fun is to experience the different sensation uh, at different points. But, you know, but it, it, but speaking generally, you know, not necessarily looking for nuances. Um, I, I can drink this beer at room temperature. I can drink a Molson Canadian the same way, you know, not my normal choice of beer, but, <laughs> but if I'm drinking one, uh, it can be off the shelf. It doesn't matter. You know, it's, uh, once you get the beer palette, I think many people can drink beer at, at, at a, vi- you know, a wa- in a wide range of uh, temperature. I mean, it's my experience anyway. Yeah, no. But then again, mm-hmm. personal taste. Yeah, you're not wrong. No, and it is all personal taste. I mean, I, I prefer I per, I, is, I prefer yeah. my stouts and, and most of my porters at room temperature. So, uh, you know, that's that's, you know, 20 degrees Celsius, you know, or just just about 20 degrees Celsius, a little little less like like 19 or so. Uh, so, you know, you're talking 68 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the optimal temperature that for for a porter is supposed to be, you know, 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. But I actually enjoy them warmer. I think they're, they're, they open way up and you get a much wider flavor profile out of them. So, and, and to be fair, some, sometimes, you know, you set a beer down, you get distracted, you come back, it's room temperature. You just have to drink it because <laughs> it's room temperature. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, that's going to vary uh, anyway, uh, you know, with, with the uh, occasion and and uh, of course, but um, but yeah. Anyway, it's an interesting sidelight on you know having come from I think like most of us, almost all of us. I'm sure there are some people that love beer at the first sip. I wasn't one of them. So having come from pro- I, what I believe is the norm of of the strange, heavily bitter sensation being so different to the complete opposite, you know, of really enjoying the beer at at, di- at different temperatures. Uh, and different beers at different temperatures, I think shows an interesting evolution of the human palate. You know, that it's, I guess it's an acquired taste. I don't know. It's, um, it is, I mean, it's, it's, it's but it, it's also, it's also, Maybe. it's also a societal thing. I mean, um, you know, over, over in Europe, there's a lot of, lot of, uh, communities where beer is just a normal part of everyday life. I mean, from, from the moment you can basically sit yourself down at a table by yourself, you're allowed to drink it. So it's just one of those things that, that you have. And growing up for me, it was always part of our, uh, our uh, family. I mean, I've got an uncle who at last, last I knew was still a brewer at Coors. So beer has always been a big thing in our family. I mean, it's been a part of our family going, going to my, 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 uh, my grandparents emigrated to uh, the United States in the in the forties. So going over to my grandma's house, it was always German beers were always there, and there was always beer available. If if uh, if you were sitting at the table, you were allowed to have a beer, you know. So it, it's just it's one of those things that's always been part of part of who who I am growing up. It's one of those things that uh, that I've enjoyed forever, and you know, it is what it is. That's. Great. That's a good point. I mean, if the cultural context is such that, uh, you know, we, I mean, we're all exposed to certain types of drinks and foods from day one, from, from early, early on, you know, yeah, you're, you're going to accept them more, right. As, as natural. But if you, if you are introduced to a certain type of food or drink later in life, uh, the contrast with what you're used to might strike you as pronounced, right. you, know, you know, and, oh gosh, yeah. I, this is different, you know, and I don't know if I can get used to this, you know, I mean, I think we all still experience that, you know, sometimes tasting a different foreign cuisine or, or drink in some cases, you know, still. Oh yeah. And, um, yeah, so that's a factor too, but it didn't take me long to accustom to the beer palate. I must say, like I said before, about four or five times after that, the taste seemed very, uh, very, very, well, I don't know if attractive is the right word, but just good. You know, I really just enjoyed it. Yeah. And uh, that formed the springboard, I guess, for the greater interest. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. I mean, but yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It's one of those things. And it probably differs a lot person to person too. Um, but it's so, it's so great to be able just to chat with you directly about these kinds of issues, you know, no matter how often I write about them, um, I mean, and there's certainly a value to that, but it's uh, it's never quite 
the, the social aspect of this kind of interchange is, you know, really doesn't exist the same way, or, or on Twitter for that matter, when we're talking to each other in electrons. That way. <laughs> yeah. Never really quite the same as actually. So that's, it's really great what you're doing here. And that this program of shows you, you've got going, Rob. Stuff. Yeah, well, you know, the the whole point was uh, was was to try and uh, with with a little bit of fun uh, educate people on different styles of beer. People who might uh, who might uh, not be totally comfortable getting out of their box of of their macro beers. Um, so you know, we try to explain things in, in ways that are approachable. Uh, try and give people references for flavors so they know what to expect. That way, you know, they're not like they're not completely overwhelmed if, if they go to a brewery with some friends or whatever, and they're like, Oh, well I, I can only drink beer that tastes like traditional beer that I'm used to. If, if, if any, if anyone who watches this learns anything or, or gets an expectation of like, Oh, I know that this should kind of have this flavor. So I know what to expect. And then when they drink it, they won't be like, Oh my God, what the hell is this? They'll be like, Oh yeah, it does taste like that. So, you know, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you mentioned that um, because it resonates with something I've, I've long felt, which is that unless you know the, like when you were explaining the parameters of, of Porter, that, that was a very valuable exercise because unless, if you present anything to a person, uh, a drink, a food that they're not familiar with, and they have no context, no context to appreciate it, unless it's relatively simplistic in flavor, you know, maybe it's got a lot of sugar or a lot of starch and it's bland, so it, it's not offensive, you know. But if it's if it's complex to any degree and they don't understand what it is or where it's from or, or in what context it's consumed, how can they appreciate right. it, you know? So at any time, you know, I'm with somebody that hasn't tried a certain, it might be porter or, or another kind of beer, or it might be a whiskey or wine, you know, and they haven't tried it before, and if I know something about it, I try to talk a little bit about it just to give them context. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, where do you, you know, how do they know where yeah. to start? Um, I, I once read a statistic. I don't know if this is still true, but it was from a reputable source. And it said that the majority of people polled on beer preferences when they were asked if they like the taste of beer, if they like it, said they did not. They did not. The majority. This is like not craft, but mm -hmm. beer in general, you know, and I thought, wow, you know, what a pity, what a, what a missed opportunity, really, that all those people, if they knew what went into beer, if they knew what hops were and what, you know, the balance of hops and malt are and, and fun, something about the different styles, maybe they would be more primed to understand it better. I mean, they still may not love it, but how do you, you know, how do you offer somebody a, a New England or any India Pale Ale, and who who has only drunk uh, Bud Light and right. uh, that kind of beer before, and expect them to understand it. So that's why education, which is really what your program is is partly about, is so important, right? Otherwise, there you know we can't expect people to to twig to to these. These interesting things that often have a complex and quite individual history. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so education, which is connects to beer history, in my view, you know, understanding where beer came from, uh, how it got here, how craft got here, is a big part of appreciating what what it is. And most, most definitely, and, and you still may not yeah. like it, and, right? And and there and there are certain styles to this day, you know, I'll avert to you that I don't favor, you know, in general sours, I don't in general favor them, had the odd good experience. Um, but I understand them. I understand them well. I know what they are. I know their history. I've given them a hearing, <laughs> so to speak, you know, and uh, if I can put it that way. So, you know, I think that that's really what anybody interested in what they're eating or drinking should ideally try to do. You know, we can't, I can't do it with everything I encounter in life. I, I'd love to know more about the coffee I drink, the tea I drink, etc. But there's only so much yep. time and so many interests you can eat, right? But, um, but, but again, learning about it, education, 
experience, obviously, trying different things, meeting people, the like-minded. Yes, yes. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you yeah. learn something. And hopefully well, you Well, you know, something. and that's the whole thing. It's, uh, it, it, there are so many different flavors and styles of beer out there that chances are somebody who says, I don't like beer was introduced to something with no context or something that that was so foreign to them that they that they've rejected it. Um, case in point, my my sister in law used to be just a wine drinker, wouldn't drink beer at all, and we discovered it was because she didn't like the flavor of like you know pilsners and, and typical lagers. She just wasn't her thing. Um, started showing her different styles of beers and now she loves like her, her one of her favorite styles is is the shandy and the rattler so it's it you know it's got it's got sweetness from juice or fruit but it's also got the beer so she's she's transitioning to where she's like she appreciates it now she, she it won't be her first choice ever she'll she'll go for wine because that's what she really likes but if there's beers on the menu, she can look at him. She goes, Oh, I know this style. I know that I like things like this. I know that, I, you know, I don't like things like this. So she knows how to navigate now, which is, which is fantastic. So she can, she, she That's can great. be somewhere where they're just serving beer and she can find something that she can drink. Yeah. That's cool. No, I like that a lot. You know, it's uh yeah. Wow. Fascinating. There's, you know, the beer field, it's, and not just the history side. I mean, the other sides that we haven't really spoken about, but the technology, right? And the science of it and the, gosh, the hop science involved in hops. And it, it's just endless, you know, there's, and one can focus on different areas that one is interested in to, yep. to learn more. But on the tasting side, I think education is really key. It really is. Um, I, I feel that way. I, you know. For somebody to really understand what they like and and maybe why they don't like something, um, yeah. learn about it. If there's one thing I've learned, you know, in all these decades of of the beer interest, it's it's that I need to learn. I need to learn what I have, and I and there's lots more. It yes. never ends. It never ends, and and you know the 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 um, the people that Michael Jackson, who I mentioned before, the great beer writer. That's one of the things I liked about his writing, you know, that he, even late and later in life, when he had written a, quite a few books, he never lost the enthusiasm. He always seemed to, to be, to want to learn more and, uh, and, you know, didn't always claim he knew everything. He didn't. And certainly in my personal discussions with him, he was quite modest, actually, uh, which I think is the sign of, of you know, a deep thinker. Yep. No, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I say it often. I am not an expert. I am just a guy who likes to drink beer, a guy who brews beer and a guy who wants other people to enjoy beer. Um, that that's, Me too. that's the entire, that's the entire premise of this is just to get more people to enjoy beer. Um, get people to step outside their comfort zone and try something new. Cause you might find something you really like that you didn't know existed. I mean, you know, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Well, hey, Gary, we we have been talking Gosh. for almost an hour. So this is the part of the show where I say it's over, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah. any, anybody who's watched this video this far, I thank you. Uh, if uh, if you enjoyed it, please click like. Uh, if you're <laughs> feeling generous, uh, click the subscribe button. And if you want to be notified when new episodes come out, please click the little bell. If you have any questions for me, or for Gary, if you have a suggestion for a beer style, a specific beer, or a guest you'd like me to try and get on the show, please leave that stuff in the comments below. I will forward on anything that needs to be forwarded on and keep everything that doesn't. Uh, other than that, until next time, I'm Rob from the Internet. Cheers. Great. I'm Gary Gilman. All the best, uh, Rob, and thank you for this opportunity to you, chat with you, you like bet. this. Wonderful. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers, man.